created under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, unanimously ruled on the following major issues. First, China cannot claim maritime zones in the South China Sea beyond what UNCLOS provides. 12 nautical mile territorial sea for its baselines along its coast, 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone from its baselines, and additional 150 nautical miles extended continental shelf from the outer limits of its exclusive economic zone. These are the same maritime zones that coastal states all over the world can claim under international law and under UNCLOS. The consequence is that China cannot use its so-called nine dash line to claim any of the water's resources in the South China Sea. In short, the nine dash line has no legal effect whatsoever. Additionally, the arbitral tribunal also declared that there is no evidence that China historically owned or controlled the South China Sea beyond China's territorial sea. Second, none of the geologic features in the Spratlys, as well as Scarborough Shoal, is habitable so as to generate a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. In short, all these disputed geologic features that are above water at high tide and thus capable of sovereign ownership are entitled only to 12 nautical mile territorial sea. Beyond their territorial seas are waters constituting the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, measured from the archipelagic baselines of the Philippines. The Philippines has exclusive sovereign rights to explore and exploit all the natural resources within its 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Third, the territorial sea of Scarborough Shoal is a common fishing ground of Filipino, Chinese, and Vietnamese fishermen. The arbitral tribunal did not rule on what state has sovereignty over Scarborough Shoal because UNCLOS does not govern sovereignty issues. Scarborough Shoal is a high tide elevation and therefore it constitutes land territory subject to sovereignty. However, the arbitral tribunal applied an exemption under international law to the exclusive use of the territorial sea by the sovereign state. And that exception is when the territorial sea has been the traditional fishing ground of fishermen from other states. The arbitral tribunal found this to be the case with respect to Scarborough Shoal. Of course, we all know that China refused to participate in the proceedings of The Hague and up to now refuses to recognize the arbitral ruling. Despite the ruling of the arbitral tribunal that it had jurisdiction over the dispute for two reasons. First, China, like all other signatory states, agreed when it signed UNCLOS that it would be subject to compulsory arbitration in case of future disputes, in effect giving its prior consent to be sued. Second, the dispute brought by the Philippines did not fall under any of the exceptions recognized under UNCLOS where a signatory state can refuse to submit to the jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal. Will China ever comply with the arbitral ruling? Will a nuclear armed state, a superpower in the region, ever comply with the ruling of an arbitral tribunal adverse to it in favor of a militarily weak non-nuclear armed state? What is the history of nuclear armed states complying with arbitral rulings adverse to them and in favor of weaker non-nuclear armed states. In Nicaragua versus the United States, International Court of Justice, 1986, ruled that the U.S. violated Nicaragua's territorial integrity and sovereignty when the U.S. placed mines in the territorial waters of Nicaragua and supplied arms to the Contra rebels. The nuclear armed U.S., the greatest economic and milita military power on Earth, refused to participate in the proceedings and also refused to comply with the ruling, which directed the U.S. and Nicaragua to negotiate the amount of damages the U.S. would pay in Nicaragua. Because of the U.S. refusal to negotiate the damages, Nicaragua asked the ICJ to proceed with the hearings on the amount of damages, which Nicaragua claimed ran into billions of dollars. In early 1991, when the proceedings were ongoing, the U.S. and Nicaragua entered into an understanding. Without conceding liability, the U.S. would provide 541 million U.S. dollars in economic aid to Nicaragua and resume commercial relations with Nicaragua if Nicaragua would withdraw the pending case with the ICJ. In June 1991, Nicaragua's National Assembly repealed the law requiring the U.S. to pay damages to Nicaragua. 
On 12 September 1991, Nicaragua informed the ICJ that Nicaragua, and I quote, places on record the discontinuance by the Republic of Nicaragua of the proceedings instituted by the application filed on 9 April 1984. In short, Nicaragua accepted the amicable arrangement of the U.S. that resulted in the termination of the dispute and the resumption of their normal diplomatic and economic relations. In the Arctic Sunrise case between the Netherlands and Russia, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or ITLOS, issued a provisional order on 22 November 2013 upon the request of Netherlands, ordering Russia, a nuclear armed power, to immediately release the Arctic Sunrise crew and vessel upon the posting of a bond by the Netherlands in the amount of 3.6 million euros. Russia refused to participate in the proceedings and refused to comply with the ITLOS order. On December 18, 2013, the Russian parliament amended its amnesty law to include hooliganism, the crime that the Arctic Sunrise crew were charged. Before Christmas Day of 2013, or just over a month after the ITLOS order, Russian President Putin pardoned the entire Arctic Sunrise crew and released the vessel. Putin said that the crew and vessel were released because of Russian law, not because of the ITLOS order. On 10 July 2017, the Arbitral Tribunal constituted to determine the damages suffered by the Arctic Sunrise ordered Russia to pay the Netherlands 5.4 million euros for the seizure and detention of the Arctic Sunrise vessel. In May 2019, the Netherlands and Russia reached a settlement on the damages to be paid, with Russia agreeing to pay the Netherlands one half of the amount awarded. 2.7 million euros in, in full settlement of the award of damages. Thus, a nuclear armed state that lost to a small non-nuclear armed state complied with the order of the arbitral tribunal to pay damages to the satisfaction of the winning state. In the Mauritius versus United Kingdom arbitration, the arbitral tribunal ruled that the United Kingdom breached its obligations under UNCLOS when it constituted a marine protected area around the Chagos Archipelago without consulting Mauritius, to which the Chagos Archipelago would eventually be returned by the UK as a former colonial power. The arbitral tribunal ordered the UK, a nuclear armed state, to consult with Mauritius, a non-nuclear armed state. The UK declared that it was ready to comply with the order of the arbitral tribunal. In the Bangladesh versus India arbitration, the arbitral tribunal awarded Bangladesh 19,467 square kilometer out of the 25,602 square kilometer or four-fifths of the mar maritime area under dispute in the Bay of Bengal. And in four decades of dispute between India, a nuclear armed state, and Bangladesh, a non-nuclear armed state. After the judgment was announced, the Indian spokesperson stated, we respect the verdict of the tribunal. The Bangladeshi foreign minister replied, we commend India for its willingness to resolve this matter peacefully by legal means for its acceptance of the tribunal's judgment. I have cited these four cases where nuclear armed states accepted decisions of arbitral tribunals adverse to them and in favor of non-nuclear armed states. That is one nuclear armed state that still has to accept an adverse ruling in favor of a non-nuclear armed state. And that is China, which lost to the Philippines in the South China Sea arbitration in July 2016. Will China ever comply with the arbitral ruling? The Philippines and China signed in November 2018 a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, on how to cooperate in exploring and developing oil and gas in the West Philippine Sea. The West Philippine Sea refers to the portion of the South China Sea that is under Philippine sovereignty or sovereign rights or jurisdiction. The area of cooperation covers waters within Philippine EEZA that are encroached by China's Nine Dash Line. In July 2019, the Philippines and China signed the Terms of Reference, or TOR, that would implement the MOU. When President Duterte visited Beijing last September 2019, China and the Philippines named their respective representatives to the steering committee that oversees the implementation of the MOU and TOR. Early this November 2019, the steering committee held its first meeting in Beijing. 
The next and final step to operationalize the MOU and TOR is for the working group, group composed of representatives of China National Offshore Oil Company, or CINOC, and Forum Energy, which are commercial enterprises, to meet and agree on the terms of their co commercial cooperation. Forum Energy holds a service contract from the Philippine government to explore and develop the gas in Wheat Bank, which is within Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone and within China's Nine Dash Line. Sinuk could either be a subcontractor of Forum Energy or may buy equity into Forum Energy or both. The working group is expected to meet in February of 2020. What is the significance of the MOU and TOR and their implementation? Under the MOU and TOR, a Chinese state-owned commercial enterprise will work under authority of a service contract awarded by the Philippine government to explore and develop Reed Bank. The service contract declares that the gas belongs to the Philippine state and the service contract shall be governed by Philippine law. Under the service contract, the Philippine gets 60% of the net proceeds as owner of the gas, while the service contractor gets 40% of the net proceeds for providing all the capital, equipment, technology, and services in exploring and extracting the gas. There is no express or formal admission by China that the gas in Wheat Bank is within Philippine exclusive economic zone or that the Philippines has sovereign rights over Wheat Bank. However, as expressly stated in the service contract, which is a vehicle for cooperation established in the MOU and TOR, the Philippine state is the owner of the gas in Wheat Bank. Under the MOU, the TOR, and the arbitral ruling, the Philippines is safe that its sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea are preserved and protected. As Foreign Secretary Teddy Boyloxin stated, and I quote, we are almost there, end of quote. We need only the commercial agreement between Sinuk and Forum Energy to finalize this cooperation in oil and gas in the West Philippine Sea. Before the Philippines filed its arbitration case against China in January of 2013, Sinuk and Forum Energy negotiated a cooperation agreement, and they agreed on all the commercial terms. But at the last minute, Sinuk wanted a provision in the agreement that, China, that the Chinese government has the right to tax the operations in Reed Bank. The power to tax is a sovereign power. This was a deal breaker as our foreign <coughs> lawyers who were then preparing the arbitration case advised the Philippines that such a provision amounted to conceding sovereign rights to China in Reed Bank. So, I have no doubt that Sinuk and Forum Energy can easily agree on a commercial cooperation agreement. And Sinuk and the Chinese government know that any provision giving China sovereign rights of a lead bank will be a deal breaker. Recently, during the standoff between Vietnam and China in Vanguard Bank, China told Vietnam to look at the MOU and TOR with the Philippines as a possible solution to their dispute. Clearly, China sees the MOU and TOR as a template for a South China Sea-wide resolution to the maritime dispute between China and the five ASEAN coastal states. That is the way I see it also. So we are now in the cusp of a lasting solution to the most intractable maritime dispute in the world today. But the Philippines must stay the course and stick to the MOU and TOR in the service contract approach to safeguard its sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea. There must be no deviation from this approach. Why is China agreeing to the service contract approach under the MOU and TOR? The arbitration ruling has debunked China's legal and historical claim to 85.7% of the South China Sea. China cannot claim waters in the South China Sea beyond what UNCLOS provides, which is what other coastal states all over the world can also claim. With the arbitration ruling, no government in the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia can cede its sovereign rights to China without incurring the wrath of its own people. In short, because of the arbitral ruling, ceding sovereign rights to China will be seen by the people of these ASEAN states as a betrayal of the highest national interest. The peoples of the world outside China have also come to understand that China's historical narrative that it owned the South China Sea since 2,000 years ago is utterly false. 
This historical narrative has been exposed as a fake history of the millennium, the fake news of the century. It is just a matter of time before the Chinese people themselves will realize that this historical narrative taught to them by their government from grade school to college is a pure fiction. China is also facing other disputes and problems, a trade war with the U.S. and massive protests in Hong Kong. China's maritime belt and road initiative, which starts in the South China Sea, cannot inspire confidence of a peaceful rise among other states along the maritime route if China continues to claim almost the entire South China Sea, depriving five ASEAN coastal states of their exclusive economic zones, which are guaranteed to them under international law and UNCLOS, to which China itself is a party. China also realizes that an overwhelming number of coastal states support the arbitral ruling. Before the ruling came out, the G20 countries declared that China and the Philippines must abide with the ruling of the arbitral tribunal. Small or militarily weak coastal states sharing maritime borders with large or militarily stronger states will naturally support the arbitral ruling for it is in their national interest that their stronger neighbors comply with international law and compass and do not follow China's example. Otherwise, their stronger neighbors may also seize their exclusive economic zones. The naval powers of the world, the US, UK, France, Japan, Australia, India, and Canada, have been regularly exercising freedom of navigation and overflight operations in the high seas and exclusive economic zones of the South China Sea, affirming the arbitral ruling that there are high seas in the South China Sea, and around the high seas, are the exclusive economic zones of coastal states like the Philippines. This freedom of navigation and overflight operations, which are taking place with more frequency now, debunk China's claim to ownership of the waters and resources falling within China's nine dash line claim. This freedom of navigation and overflight operations are the most robust enforcement of the arbitral ruling. China now realizes that it must make the most out of a difficult situation. And I believe this is why China signed the MOU and TOR adopting the service contract approach. China is indirectly and gradually moving away from the indefensible Nine Dust Line claim, in the same way that Taiwan's Kuomintang Party, which invented the Nine Dust Line in 1946, has moved away from using the Nine Dust Line to claim all the waters enclosed within the line. In March 2016, Taiwan's International Law Society, upon instruction from then Taiwan President Ma, who belonged to the Kuomintang Party, submitted an amicus brief to the arbitral tribunal at The Hague. In their submission, the Taiwanese never mentioned the Nine Dust Line as basis of their claim to waters and resources beyond the territorial sea of Ituaba, the Spratly's largest island which is controlled by Taiwan. Taiwanese argued exclusively on the basis of Ancas that Itoaba is habitable and thus entitled to, to a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. So I see the MOU and TOR, which adopts the service contract approach, as a way by which China aligns its claim to waters and resources in the South China Sea in accordance with Ancas, following the approach of the Kuomintang Party from whom the Chinese Communists inherited the Nine Dash Line claim. Yes, I see a light at the end of the tunnel with respect to the maritime dispute in the South China Sea. The territorial dispute, of course, which is not governed by the arbitral ruling, will go on and on and on until global warming submerges all the Spratly Islands and Scarborough Shoal. The forces of nature will solve the intractable territorial dispute in the Spratlys and Scarborough Shoal. In the meantime, what may be the possible interim solution to the territorial dispute in the Spratlys? As you know, the arbitral ruling did not rule on what state has sovereignty over the high tide rocks and highlands in the Spratlys and Scarborough Shoal. The arbitral ruling only resolved the maritime dispute, not the territorial dispute. As recommended by marine biologists, I propose that all the claimant states to the Spratlys should declare the Spratlys an international marine protected area. The Spratlys are the breeding ground of fish in the South China Sea. Without the Spratlys, the South China Sea will not be rich in fishery as it is today, accounting for 12% of the annual global fish catch while occupying only 2.5% of the ocean surface of the world. 
how do you declare the Spanish is a marine protected area? The claimant states must suspend their territorial claims for the next 25 to 50 years. The claimant states must prohibit fishing within the territorial seas of the islands or geologic features they occupy. The claimant states must convert other military facilities into tourism or marine research centers. Only Coast Guard vessels shall be allowed within the marine protected areas. Will China agrees to the, agree to these conditions? China today takes over 50% and growing of the annual fish catch in the South China Sea, up from 20% in the 1990s. China will be the greatest beneficiary if the spratlys, the breeding ground of fish in the South China Sea, are declared a marine protected area. So hopefully, China will give priority to feeding its people in the long term than maintaining costly military facilities in artificial islands that will only be ravaged, ravaged by sea level rise in a few decades. In the four cases that I just mentioned, Nicaragua versus US, Netherlands versus Russia, Mauritius versus UK, Bangladesh versus India, where weaker non-nuclear armed states fought legal battles with far stronger nuclear armed states before international tribunals. The nuclear armed states, the non-nuclear armed states won clear victories and were able to extract satisfaction with the judgments of the tribunal. Of course, not all the judgments in the four cases I mentioned have, may have been implemented and satisfied as a judge by the arbitral tribunal. However, what matters is that the winning state freely and voluntarily agreed to a final settlement with the losing state to the satisfaction of both states. Even in litigations or arbitration within private parties, the winning party may voluntarily accept innovative adjustments of the final judgment to put the matter to rest and to maintain good relations with the losing party. This same harmonious motive applies particularly in relations between and among sovereign states. There is no international sheriff or policeman that executes judgments of international tribunals created under UNCLOS. The parties to the arbitration are supposed to comply voluntarily with the judgment as part of their treaty obligations under UNCLOS. <coughs> under the United Nations system, awards of the International Court of Justice may be enforced by the UN Security Council. But if the losing state is a veto-wielding permanent member of the UN Security Council, then that losing state can always veto any enforcement measure that may be proposed before the UN Security Council. Thus, enforcement of a judgment against a permanent member of the United Nations Council, like China, will have to be enforced through world opinion. This, this includes the collective efforts of like-minded states to deny the losing state any benefit from its breach of international law. This is the essence of freedom of navigation and overflight operations with the naval powers in the South China Sea, which is a clear objective of maintaining the rules-based international legal order in the oceans and seas of the world. The legal victory of the Philippines against China is the remaining judgment of an international tribunal between a weak non-nuclear armed state and a far stronger nuclear armed state that still remains unsatisfied today. However, in the words of Foreign Secretary Teddy Boy Loxin, and I quote him, we are almost there. Once Sinuk and Forum Energy agree on the terms of a commercial cooperation, and China does not inject any sovereign rights issue, then we can say that the maritime dispute in the West Philippine Sea has been finally settled. And the same settlement formula can be applied to the rest of the maritime dispute in the South China Sea. China's willingness to allow its state-owned commercial enterprise to be a service contractor or to work through a service contractor of the Philippine government in exploding and exploiting oil and gas in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea opens up an innovative adjustment of the arbitral tribunal ruling to the satisfaction of both the Philippines and China. As long as we stay the course by adhering to the rule of law, by not waiving our sovereign rights as affirmed by the arbitral tribunal, by following the structure of the MOU and TOR, we should be able to tell our children and grandchildren and future generations of Filipinos that when our country called us to defend our nation's sovereign rights against a nuclear armed superpower of the region, we answered the call, we served, and we never wavered 
and defend their sovereign rights through the rule of law. Thank you and a pleasant day to everyone.